My name is Taka Reinga. I own a full-service WordPress agency in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. And often when talking about accessibility to our clients, I use the SEO argument. Are you aware of that argument? It basically says, just, you know, if Google is blind and we create a... Is it working? Cool, thanks. Google is blind. It's the biggest blind user on Earth, on planet Earth, basically. So if we make our website more accessible and um, indexable by that, um, we're basically the profits both, both accessibility and SEO. But the more I was using this, um, this argument to, towards clients, I was feeling that I was kind of cheating them or thinking, is this really the best that we can come up with? Is this argument strong enough to build a case on and make them spend a bit more money, a bit more time on an accessible project? So, what is web accessibility and why is it important? Looking at the different WordCamps and also outside of WordCamps, outside our WordPress ecosystem, um, you see that awareness around accessibility is growing. There's more people talking about it, there's more talks about it. But what are we really talking about here? According to the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, web accessibility means that websites, tools and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. So, we're talking about people with disabilities using the web. Mm. What does that mean then? What, who, what does it mean for them to use the web with a disability? How does it impact their experience? How many people are we talking about? In this talk, I'll go into some numbers to illustrate on the amount of people that we're talking about and also the potential of this group of people. Um, there's a lot of numbers in here. We're going to do some math together. Um, I put all the resources I used in the last slides, so please just sit back, relax, and let me do my talk. So, when looking for a definition of disability, um, I found out it's quite hard to come up with one, um, one definition that tells me a bit about the scope. Um, the statistical definition differs and operational definitions differ. Something I found really interesting to, to find when, in this bit of research is the so-called medical theor theoretical model of accessibility and the social theoretical model of disability. The first one um, says disability is a restriction of ability to per perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. Disabilities are descriptions of dis disturbances in function of the level of the person. This model basically looks at the disability as the problem that belongs to the disabled person. It's not seen as something that concerns society or anybody else than the individual affected. And this is evidenced by the World Health Organization's definition of 1980. The second model which came after, what? after that, the social theoretical model, said there's a recognition within the social model that there's a great deal that society can do to reduce and ultimately remove some of these dis disabling barriers, and that this task is the responsibility of society rather than the disabled person. So basically saying that um, through designing everything to meet the needs of the average, or what is considered normal, the majority of people that are not disabled, we are basically uh, adding barriers to people with a disability. The social model recognizes that there is a lot that society can do to remove these barriers. Fortunately, there's a bit more. Uh, W3C is also, um, there's an, a web accessibility initiative, and there's a whole section on their website. Um, that goes a bit further than the definition that we just saw. This was the original definition I came up with, um, telling that it's about people with disabilities using the web. But it continues 
and specifies this a bit more. It is about people. Um, accessibility is about people. Um, being able to perceive, understand, navigate and interact with the web and even contribute to the web. It continues to mention different types of disabilities that may prevent access to the web or affect it. Disabilities like auditory, cognitive, neurological, speech, physical or visual or any combination of those. What's important to note is that we're not just talking about people with these disabilities. It also benefits people without disabilities. Some examples are people using mobile phones uh, or other types of screens and devices. Older people, their needs change due to aging. We all have temporary disabilities. Maybe you break an arm, you lose your glasses, something like that. Or what about bright sunlight? You're trying to get some work done and suddenly the, the sun hits the screen. Or being in a full train commuting to work, you want to watch a video, but it doesn't proffer, uh, offer subtitles, so only audio. There's a really cool playlist um, on web accessibility perspectives, and I was told to shut up while this plays. So there's a full playlist uh, on YouTube on different uh, short videos, like 45 seconds, maybe a minute, where you see sort of the overlap between situational disabilities, medical disabilities, and maybe growing older and just changing needs. Um, this is also shared at the end of the presentation in the, in the references. Okay, so you know, we kind of know who, you know, who's impacted, who we're doing this for, what we're talking about. That makes me wonder, how many people are we talking about? How big is the scope? Are we doing this for the few people that we personally know that maybe are blind, deaf, or in a wheelchair or something? Or is that number a bit bigger than that? Again, because definitions differ, it's hard to come up with just really factual numbers to use. Uh, World Bank mentions 1 billion people worldwide, or about 50% of the, of the global population. European Union uh, comes up with slightly different numbers, a bit higher even. Um, they predict 120 million um, EU citizens to be impacted by 2020 or having a disability, which is 20% or more than 20% of the EU population. That's 20% of the people I see here in this room now. It's quite a chunk. So this tells us a bit about the why of accessibility. We're not just, just doing this for those 20%. We're doing this for you and me and maybe our grandparents or parents. So I want to see some hands. Who here in this room agrees with me that web accessibility should be the bare minimum of any web project, web project that we take on? That was a lot more than I expected or than the note that I had here, but I would say that's about 70, 75 percent of you here agrees that with me. So we can make a deal then. Let's make a deal here and now, you and me, that we are going to teach our clients on the importance of web accessibility, that the next project that we're going to take on is going to be a little bit more accessible than the last one that we did. It doesn't need to be perfect immediately, it's more important to make the steps and get there and keep it in mind when working on a project. So with every project we deliver, we'll try to be better and improve accessibility for all. Agree? Yay. Okay. Um, 
some years ago, we start inspired by Rian, actually, uh, who's sitting here in the front and doing an amazing talk later today. Inspired by Rian on a, a couple of WordCamps in the past, as an agency, we started telling our clients, we find this is the bare minimum of a web project, like SEO that they're all asking for, like performance, like security. It should be there. It should be part of the foundation of a project. But I also experienced that when talking to clients, and I also mean potential clients then, um, that just this SEO argument is not always solid enough. You know, the higher the number, the more math they're doing in the back of the room thinking, hey, is this a good deal or is that not a good deal? So I started investigating numbers a bit. Let's try to see if we can convince our future client. And what's important to note is that with a business case, this is about either money or risk. So you should be thinking, does it somehow increase income, money coming in? Does something, in this case accessibility, save us money somehow? Or does it help us mitigate risk? Maybe we can keep away from lawsuits. And what's really important here is that you investigate your client, try to understand their business, and keep asking questions. Don't just deal with the answer they give you, but keep asking questions. Try to interview their audience. Try to get a deep understanding of their business, what their gains are, what their threats are, what opportunities are. Be sure that you're prepared. And I have a little bit of a uh, math, a little case here that we're going to go through to show you how this can work. Let's say there's a web shop owner uh, that you get in touch with somehow, maybe here in this WordCamp, and he tells you about his web shop doing uh, 100,000 uh, visitors per month. Um, sales are, you know, okay, they're pretty good. Average order value, 75 euros per order. Um, and after talking a bit, you know, you find out the website is quite old, it could use some changes, and uh, you agree on writing a proposal to redo the whole thing. Design, development, just the whole installation. But of course, this client is going to ask you, be nice, be gentle. You know the excuses, maybe another developer already used the budget, or, uh, well, times are tough, and, uh, you know, we don't have too much money available, but we do want to take on this project. So you go home, start writing your proposal, crunching numbers, thinking, OK, let's you know, shave off on the design hours. Let's take away some project management. Who needs that anyways? Um, you know, maybe development can be a, bit, a little bit more agile than, than normally. And then you realize, we just made a deal here. Every project that we were going to take on was going to be more accessible than the one we did before. So accessibility is suddenly part of this proposal as well. So let's say we're going to add some design hours to this proposal. Make sure that you quote enough design hours to have someone look at color contrast, uh, let someone look at the, the style guide that your client is providing to you, maybe. Make sure that the design is appealing. It should look good. For anybody that can see this website, it should look good. Development-wise, it kind of depends. Um, if it's all new to you, make sure that you, you know, add some hours for investigation, for, for learning. Add an, an LE audit, so there's an accessibility audit. Try to get someone in to, to help you with that, to kind of validate your work. Maybe you have some edge case scenarios that you need help with. Maybe using a plugin of which the output is not really accessible. And this one is often forgotten, and that is train the staff, train your client and their users, train or not their users, sorry, their their employees. So whoever is working on content, train them as well. It's not just about the process of going through this web shop and adding products and dealing with orders. It's also about writing content that can be read and understood by anyone. Make sure there's alt text on images. eBay is doing a really cool job with that. They have a call to action in a lot of the product images also. Okay, then you realize 
this is not one of those cheap offers that your client was asking for. But we were prepared. We know that this client had 100,000 visitors per month. We also know that the average order value is 75 euros. And a bit of Googling and investigation told me that the average conversion percentage in online retail is about 3%. Okay, it depends on the country, it depends on your audience and the product, of course, but an average of 3% is a good one to, to play with. Now, we also know that 71% of the users with a disability, so 71% of those 20%, basically, will simply leave a website that is not accessible. They will just leave and probably not return to see if you change the website in the meantime. So we had 100,000 visitors. 20,000 of these 100,000 have a disability. And suddenly, this audience shrinks to one-third. We only have 29% left. And we're just hoping that we can make some money of them. But what about those 14,200 users that came to your website with the intent to buy something? With an average of 3% conversion rate, this means that 31,950 euros per month is not being spent in your shop. And it's not that these people close the browser and they, they stop Googling or whatever, and they think, well, no sneakers for me. They just go to your competitor's website, a competitor that has an accessible website. That's a freaking 32,000 euros per month that's just there. And we're not, it's not for us, it's for the competitors. And this amazes me. There are so many companies hiring SEO consultants or conversion optimization specialists, or uh, somehow clients all know that one second of delay in, in Amazon costs them $1.6 bil uh, billion dollars or something like that. But they have no freaking clue about what huge audience is kind of walking away from their website when you're talking about accessibility. This is 384,000 euros per year that you could have had in your pocket, extra revenue. And then there's two more things to take into con consideration to make this even worse. The first one, the majority, 81% of these com consumers will pay more in the competitor's web shop that is accessible. And there's something that's called the viral uh, effect of satisfactory online experience, which kind of means that you know, if you really enjoyed shopping there, and we have some really famous examples in, in the Netherlands where the experience of buying something and the whole, you know, all the steps, it, it's like someone is dealing with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis, like you were in a real physical shop. If that experience is satisfying, you will tell your friends, you will tell it on a birthday, you will share it online somewhere. And especially in this group of people, 20%, of your target audience, this is probably happening more than just me or you on a birthday party telling about something you, sh you bought online. For a lot of people, it means they don't leave the house and use the internet to shop. That's their main way of interacting with the world. So this is one case that you can use. It's not a case for all. We're not maybe not working all on an e-commerce website, uh, but it is a case that you can that kind of illustrates that with numbers, you can make the case to your client. I'm pretty sure that this client that was asking for this cheap web shop, or, you know, be gentle, he's willing to pay for this. There's quite some money going to his competitors. And then there's some other cases that you can find online or can use uh, the World Wildlife Fund in Canada. They had their best fundraising years, year after they uh, launched a accessible website, $21 million just by making the website. It's not just by making the website, but that was the uh, annual revenue of, that, uh, of those donations. So that's about getting money from your audience. And the other business case that you can make is about where can you save money? The other example, SNS Bank in the Netherlands created an uh, accessible website and that meant that the phone calls with questions about their products and services went down 15 to 30%. We don't know the exact number. We do know 
that they had 70,000 calls per year with people just asking the same stuff over and over and over again. That's saving them 1.7 million euros per year. That's a valid business case, I think. And there's also the risk factor. And the risk factor is basically about mitigating risk. Um, depending on where you are in the world, there is some form of legis legislation around accessibility or discrimination. So we're talking about mitigating the risk or the probability of risk, legal risk, or maybe damage to your brand. One of the earliest examples of um, sort of a lawsuit that had an impact and had effect is the Sydney Olympics in 2000, where a blind person um, basically went to court and said, well, I'm blind and I feel that this website is not fully accessible to me. And under the Commonwealth Disability Discrimination Act, um, this was uh, agreed upon by the judge and the Sydney Olympics got three weeks to just improve the whole website, make it, make it, make it accessible. In the States, there's something called the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the amount of lawsuits has been going through the roof in the last couple of years. Uh, and the fines are, are hefty. Um, so this is something that you should consider as well. And also, depending on where your client is, if they're operating in the US, this is something to worry about. Um, I have some examples of ADA uh, lawsuits. Most of them are being settled between parties, so we don't know what the outcome was or what really happened. Uh, but Walt Disney, for example, um, they, the claim, the, the, the plaintiff said, okay, these sites were overloaded with video and audio content. And for me, as a, a disabled person, a physically impaired person, I cannot switch it off. I cannot deal with this website, and this is just horrible. The resolution was, okay, first, fix it. Second, 15,000 euros for the, the blind person that um, complained. And a total of $1.5 million of legal fees. I don't know, but I don't have that in my pocket to you know, settle um, lawsuits. And then, this is just money. We're not even talking about brand image. We're talking now about Walt Disney Company. But this example has been in other talks, and you can find it on the web. Target, which is some sort of a Walmart in the US, um, was sued with the claim that the, uh, the website lacks alt text. The resolution, make it work, make it accessible. Oh, and by the way, pay $6 million to a damages fund. And then there's HRB Digital, something I never heard of, but apparently it's the largest tax returns company in the US. Um, and someone was telling them that the website was incompatible with assistive technologies, screen readers, stuff like that. So again, make it work. Oh, and by the way, pay 45,000 to the two individuals that complained. And there was a civil penalty of 55,000. And the other thing is they had to fix this before the next tax term was there, tax filing term. The problem in the States is that this ADA that is being used to sue companies that have inaccessible websites. And also, it is basically about discrimination. So you can sue for any any type of uh, entity, as long as you feel discriminated and you have a case uh, that you want to uh, bring to court. The problem is, it doesn't provide a standard. So, it's basically up to the company to kind of, you know, in fear for lawsuits, just try to be accessible, uh, but there's not a set of rules to follow. And it kind of depends on the, on the users, whoever feels uh, discriminated and can make this as a solid case, bring it to court, then maybe this was not good enough, what you did. That's the big problem in, uh, in the States with the ADA. In Europe, we have a directive that was um, uh, agreed upon in 2016, which is called the Transnational Implementation of Accessible Web Standards. And this directive had to be implemented by national uh, law, so the EU member states needed to uh, make this into national law. Um, 
main message being public sector bodies need to uh, have accessible websites by the end of September 2019, this year. And then you see what happens if countries are being able to make this into their own law, that is kind of different perspectives and different ways of treating that. Austria, public sector bodies have been legally required to have an accessible website starting 2016. So basically, directive became law immediately. In Spain, public sector bodies um, can be fined for poor web accessibility. In Italy, the person responsible for this public body website can be sued. Oh, I don't want that. Um, Norway, it goes for both public bodies and businesses. And in Switzerland, it's becoming is increasingly common for companies to be sued under this, uh, this law. So, to conclude, I gave you some numbers or kind of example how to make the business case for your client if you want to convince them that it's not just about SEO or something. Um, and of course, there's law. But personally, I feel this should not be about money. This should not be just about complying with the law. Um, we're basically talking about, you know, you and me. We're talking about our parents, our grandparents, people around us. We are society. Uh, so although I mentioned quite some numbers, I feel that the, the accessibility business case should not be about money. I feel it's just the right thing to do. Three minutes left. By the way, that SEO argument is true. So you can still use it, but you have some more material to use as well. Um, I already mentioned it, 4.30. Um, Rianne is giving an amazing talk if you want to dive into area. Um, so go see that. It's in Circus. It's down two floors down, I think. And if you want to reach out to me, Twitter, Takarenga, or at Level Level. And the talks are already published on this URL. So feel free to download them. There's some two extra slides with all the resources and links to use where and whenever you want. That was it. Thank you, Taka. Welcome. We do have a couple of questions or minutes for, uh, for questions. Um, so raise your hand if you have a question. Um, I can maybe start off. Uh, we're just thinking about um, the definition maybe of disabilities and you used some numbers about uh, percentages mm -hmm. and sort of bro broke that down. Uh, does that, like what, what, what is the definition of, of uh, disability? Like just as an example, like I'm hearing, uh, I have hearing problems and I have a hearing aid, um, but I don't know if, if like my hearing problem has so much to do with website websites or mm. I'm not really affected too much about that no. but so so the things that you showed here like is that what's the definition of, of uh, well it's basically saying that anyone that has a, a the, the medical definition would be that anyone that has a, a problem an impairment yeah. that um, uh, which means that some function acts differently than what is considered normal okay for a human yeah um, so even though you maybe don't feel it as a disability, you're completely used to it. I didn't see it. I didn't no. hear it on the They're way so you small. spoke to me. <laughs> uh, I think that goes for most people. Yep. So you maybe will not consider yourself to be disabled. And it goes for a lot of people wearing glasses, for example. Yeah. Do you feel disabled? Or is it just something that you put up in the morning and you know put it down before you go to but bed? So uh, glasses and lenses, if you use that, which I yeah. also do. But uh, is would that also be considered? Um, it would be consi under this definition under this of the, yeah. It would be considered okay. uh, a, a disability. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Do we have other questions? Raise your hand. Question over here. Okay, uh, I just wanted to ask about the font that you used in your presentation, because I know that there are some um, dyslexia-friendly fonts, and I could see that this one has quite a big difference between, for example, the A's and the E's and the numbers, the way they're defined. So I, was, I wanted to ask if that was meant to be a uh, dyslexia-friendly font. 
I'm not aware of that, that we used a dyslexia-friendly font in our brand guide. Someone's waving at me. Hi. <laughs> Let's get a microphone over there. I'm not aware of this one being t uh, specifically uh, friendly yeah, for that. Yeah, there are like two types of fonts, like dyslexia and open dyslexic. Um, but the thing with those fonts, they're not good for every dyslexic type. So they're for some, they're helpful, but they're not for all dyslexic helpful. So you like, I would recommend if you want to use them, don't use them as the only font, more, more use them as a fallback font, because they also can be really distracting for some type of dyslexic people. And for some time, it's like easier to read, but it's like complicated a little bit. Yeah, I was not going to go into all the details and all the uh, measurements that you can take to, or the, all the measures that you can take to make your website accessible. Uh, Rian and Maya are a lot better in explaining that, I think. Um, but I'm pretty sure this font is not because it's in our uh, brand. Um, and um, no. Get the microphone closer. <laughs> It's not. Rian just confirmed it's not. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Please raise your hand. We have a couple of more minutes. Are there? Uh, thanks. Uh, I had a question about uh, how do you measure in individual projects uh, how many persons in the target group are having the disabilities? Because now you were talking about the person of all people, but what about the target group? Yeah, well, that is something that sometimes clients say, like, ah, but those people, those people are not in my uh, target group, or these people don't buy in my shop. Um, you don't know that. And that website owner probably also doesn't know it. Google uh, Analytics doesn't tell you that. Um, of course, it could be someone with an impairment shopping for Christmas to give it to the person that is considered to be the audience of this web shop. So it's just easier to make it accessible um, than to try to find, it's probably more costly also to find out if this actual type is within your uh, audience or, um, no, I would skip that part. <laughs> it makes it really difficult, yeah. No. yeah. Just make it accessible. Yeah, but because that's uh, costing money, <laughs> of course, to do. Yeah, it, well, so. that, that's interesting to note. I only had 30 minutes in my talk, so I had to <laughs> take out some slides. And one of them was the, the cost of uh, making a website accessible. And we as an agency that see that, you know, there's a bit of a, a startup phase. You need to kind of get some meth m uh, yeah, methods in place. But once the whole team is convinced and everybody's working with that, um, I would not say it's it's costing extra. We're not adding 10% to to our projects just because they're suddenly uh, accessible. So it's really maybe the first ones, but I would say that's good for anyone to you know go through that phase and learn a bit and and then apply for everybody because there's more people profiting from that than that single client that will suffer from a five or 10% higher price. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Okay, a quick question <laughs> from Daniel. Uh, hi, my name is Daniel from uh, Genium. Um, just a comment, I think it's, even though I, th I don't think that's why we should be making uh, sites accessible, but I, I think it can be useful that to make a client realize that um, when you're making something more accessible, it will also probably help people who are not disabled. Exactly. But are maybe in a situation where where a better contrast will help yeah, and yeah. and um, and also make sure that they're not that you have like a common understanding of what you're talking about because yeah. I've, I've often noticed that we've I've been talking about accessibility and then realize that the person I'm talking to is only thinking about maybe wheelchairs and blind wheelchairs and or death, sometimes um, it's yeah. sometimes it's only blind people or some for some people it's just they're thinking about maybe color blindness. And and um, then when you don't, we're not talking about the same thing. It can be difficult to make yep. argu a good argument. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's it's key to really explain and show the impact that you can make, and that it's not just this twenty percent that is disabled, but it's about so many more people. It's about you and I uh, in in bright sunlight, um, or in a train watching video without um, 
subtitles or something like that. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Take. Welcome.